Everything you, you're going to hear in this session is purely one man's opinion. It's just from, the, from where I sit. It isn't gospel truth. Uh, other experts will tell you different stories or different things. But the thing is, the reason why you're here is, A, because you have creativity, judgment, and talent, so therefore you can make your own mind up about what's right. Just take what bits make sense to you, ignore the stuff that sounds like complete bollocks, and come to your own decisions. The other thing is that you're here because you're motivated. The people that had a chance to come and thought, no, I don't think I'll bother today, those aren't the people who are going to succeed in getting their music heard in the same way that you are. So already uh, you've self-selected yourselves. Um, as I say, just one man's opinions from one perspective. But I'm going to start with not an opinion. This is a fact. There is too much music in the world out there. So journalists, DJs, labels, managers, bloggers, and above all, music fans are just overwhelmed by this tidal wave of music that's coming out there. Phenomenal amounts of music are being made. And it's quite hard when you're working in your studio on your own to realise how much other stuff is out there that you're competing with in there. And the trouble is, for today's artists, you're not only competing with your peers against the other new music, but you're competing against the last 50 years of music because of things like YouTube and re-releases and stuff. So, uh, if you make music that sounds like the Beatles, why wouldn't today's 15-year-old go and buy the Beatles instead of what you're doing? So that's a downside, but I'm not here to depress you. I'm here to inspire you. And the good news is that I'm pretty confident I can tell you enough today in the next 90 minutes to make sure that the right people do listen to your music. The bad news is they will probably only listen to it for 30 seconds. And if what they hear is tame, safe, or ordinary, then it will join the other 95 rejects in the recycle bin that day. Worse, your card will get marked. It will be much harder to get them to listen for a second time if you've already sent them a substandard track. So the key thing is to be always sure that you send your very, very best work when you're getting media attention. You can get their attention, but make sure it's for something gobsmacking, not just for quite a nice track that you've made and you feel quite proud of. It's, it's not worth it. That can be an album track. That can be something you play in your live set. That doesn't mean to say that song's worthless, but don't use that one when you're going to grab somebody by the throat and say, listen to me. So they will listen, but only once. So the first question that uh, was set in the notes for this was, is your track right for radio? Now, my answer to that, there's no such thing as radio. There's only radio shows, and each one is different. First thing you need to know about radio shows is that 70% of what you hear on daytime radio on the BBC is playlist. It comes from a central computer that's programmed each week. The DJs have no say in what that 70% consists of. It's supplied to them, they have to play it. That's daytime shows. Commercial radio, it's worse. 98% of what you hear on commercial radio is programmed from a central computer. The DJs have no say. The producers have no say. They only have say in what they talk about between the records. The chances of a new artist with their debut release getting onto a national playlist without either a serious plugger or the muscle of a major label behind them is zero. But fuck the playlist. <laughs> because some daytime shows actually have something called free plays. So Lauren Laverne on Six Music, Steve Lamack on Six Music, Steve Wright on Radio 2. A number of the daytime shows do have a few key free play slots. And the evening shows on BBC Radio are mostly free plays. 
So there's stuff to play for, slots that you can get. But every show has its own style, its own taste, its own culture. And you need to research which shows your music will fit into. There's no point sending country music to Kerrang! Radio. There's a wide variety of specialist shows out there if you want to look for them. I mean, Mike Harding does the folk show on Radio 2. There's Destination Africa on One Extra, if that's your specific bag. There's Craig Charles's Funk and Soul show on Six Music. Bob Harris's Country and Bluegrass show on Radio 2. World Music, there's Late Junction on Radio 3. There's The Cutting Edge on Jazz FM, if you're making modern contemporary jazz. And even those specialist shows literally get hundreds of tracks a month sent to them to try and compete for one free play on that particular programme. You have to send your music to the right show. All of them are looking for the same thing, and that is an amazing song. They're not going to listen to CD number 67 in the pile and go, is that a U87 on the vocal? That's brilliant. Or, I love over-easy compression on the bass drum. They don't give a toss about how it's produced. They want an amazing song, a song that just grabs you by the throat, a song that when you, get, when you hear it, you don't go, oh, that's pretty good, like the other 67 in the pile. You want a song that makes you go, oh, my God! You want a song that makes you go, right, Mumford and Sons are out this afternoon, we're going to play this. And it's perfectly possible to write a song that good but you have to be sure that you've got it before you go for the jugular and make them listen to you. OK, let's assume you've got an amazing song, because if you haven't, none of this is going to make any difference anyway. So, you know what? Forget radio at this point. Don't start with radio. The received wisdom that you'll hear from music industry pundits, when you go to conferences, you hear other people get up, particularly people like me who've been through the 20th century music business, they'll tell you radio is the holy grail. I don't think so. Because if you think about it, in the old days, radio was the only way your music would ever get heard outside the people that you played to live in a room. Even if you got on the front cover of the NME back in the 70s, 80s or 90s, huge buzz, but if Radio 1 didn't play you, Nobody in Bolton or Cornwall or Glasgow would ever get to hear your music. Radio 1 was your only chance of reaching the national audience. And that's why the music industry obsesses about radio. You've got to get on the radio, otherwise nobody will ever hear you. That's just no longer the case. It's going to be 2013 in a month from now. And this is where you have the huge advantage I said this generation has a hard time because you're competing with all the previous generations. But you have something that we never had. The power of the internet to bypass radio, to bypass the gatekeepers. Look at Gangnam Style, from nowhere, biggest hit in the world. Has Radio 1 played it? Well, they have now. Radio is incredibly inefficient as a way of getting your music to be heard by people. Take the biggest radio station in the country, Radio 2. Suppose that Dermot O'Leary plays your song. Only the people who happened to be listening to Radio 2, of all stations, on that particular day, of all days, at that particular moment of all times in the three-hour programme, will ever hear it. When people listen to the radio, they usually do it while they're doing something else. They're driving, they're chatting to the person in the front seat, they're doing the cooking in the kitchen, they're hoovering... You know, the radio's just on in the background. What are the chances that people who are listening to the Dermot O'Leary show that day will hear your track and go, God, that's really good, what was the name? And then they'll go to the computer and sit down, type in your name into iTunes and go, bye. It's not a really likely scenario. Whereas, if one of your friends posts on Facebook and says, you have to hear this, and when you're browsing on Facebook, you click... And there is the song, right there. You play the song, and it is amazing. What are you going to do about it? First, you're going to click like. Then, you're going to play it again. And you're going to post an update for that yourself and tell your friends about it. And when you go away and, you go, and you're still singing, you think, I've got to hear some more of these guys. You go back to the page. You click through to their Bandcamp page. 
And there is the whole album that they've made. And there's not just the amazing single, but there's all these deeper, subtler, more interesting, longer tracks that they've made. And you hear the depth of this artist, what they're capable of. You get into their world. And because it's on Bandcamp, you know that the money goes direct to the artist. It's not going to get sucked into the music industry. It's going direct to the artist. And that makes my 20-year-old son click buy when he finds an artist he really likes on Bandcamp. And when you click buy, the artist has your email address. Compare that to the radio model, and it's so much more powerful as a way of getting your music across. As basic messages, all you have to be is good. If your song is that amazing, it will sell itself. So, am I saying radio doesn't matter? Are you crazy? Of course radio matters. Radio is vital. But radio is the destination. It's not the starting place where you're trying to start out from. Because if you don't have the other stuff in place, then the radio play is worthless. If they hear you on Dermot O'Leary, they Google you, you have no web presence, you might as well not have been played. Apart from anything else, nowadays radio, like press and like bloggers, will check out your online presence to see if you're actually really a serious contender before they decide to get behind you. Everybody prefers to back a winner, so they need to know that you look like a winner. What does a winner look like? A winner has 67,000 plays on their YouTube channel. A winner has 3,000 plus people following them on Twitter. A winner has a SoundCloud page where you can't see the timeline because it's thick with those little blue lines where people have posted comments and the likes is up in three figures. That's what a winner looks like. That looks like traction. That looks like somebody who has really done something amazing and who lots of other people think is amazing. And I know all the hip new music shows that are trying to like be predicting what's going to be big in 2013, those all look online before they decide whether to play a track. The track has to be amazing for them to even contemplate it. But if they have two equally amazing tracks and one of them has 67 likes on Facebook and the other one has all that stuff I've just talked about, you know which of the two is going to get that only free play slot they have that morning. The other great music industry myth is that you shouldn't put your future hit single streaming online in case people steal the audio and deprive you of sales and chart position. It's quite a widespread belief, and again, that stems back from the old music model of the 20th century. In my view, streaming is the new airplay. You actually want as many people as possible to hear your fantastic song. What's the worst case scenario? You've got such an amazing song, it's such an instant hit, that before it comes out, two million people illegally download it and spread it around the internet. How exactly is having two million rabid fans going to harm your career? There's a really sad example of this that I saw this autumn. Because one of my very favourite bands, Little Comets, they had a great single this autumn called A Little Opus. And they hired a plugger, and they got it playlisted on Six Music because it was an amazing single. It was played on rotation on Six Music. But in the weeks prior to release, there was a complete online embargo of the audio. You couldn't hear it on any of the blogs. There wasn't a video on YouTube, or there was, but it was only like a 60-second clip, but it wasn't the whole song because it was meant to be a tease. And the idea of this was that everybody would hear it on the radio go, oh God, it hasn't come out yet, must wait till the release date, and then on the day, we'd all rush out onto iTunes and buy it, and it would go into the charts. What actually happened was that the die-hard fans weren't sitting by their DAB radios waiting for the single to come on. They were getting on with their lives. And the people who did hear it on the radio and went, oh, that sounds great, and went and Googled it, couldn't find the song. So they couldn't hear it a second time to check if it was as good as they thought it was. When that single came out, it was the worst performance that Little Comets have ever had. They've always made the top 75 up till now. This didn't even figure. It came, it went, end of. Great single, wasted. So, 
developing your online presence. First and foremost, the most important thing is your name, your artist name. I looked down the list of artist names on the 3030, and they're fantastic. They're all really original, unique names. And uh, for, in, for instance, I googled a few of them. I looked up the Blazer Splits Boys. Unique, number one in the Google ranking. Nobody else is called Blazer Splits Boys. I looked up the Tuts, number one, the Tuts on Google. Only one band. A unique name makes the search much easier. People can find you like that on Google. It also avoids disputes. You don't find out there's an American band who's also called The Diamonds, who've been going for the last 30 years, and you're going to have to call yourselves The Diamonds UK as soon as you release in America, or another band in Portsmouth who've been called The Diamonds and who actually have thediamonds.co.uk already registered and who already have a fan base and a profile on BBC Introducing. A unique name, it does you such a favour. You can get thatname.co.uk, you can get thatname. Dot com. And forget what people tell you about getting dot .me and dot .eu and all those other ridiculous things. The, the real crown jewels is the dot .com of your band name, dot .com. No UK or no music at the end of it, just the name. Because if people put the name straight into the address bar, the dot .com always comes up first. And if you want to know a nice cheap place where to get dot .coms for about, I think, seven quid a year... Uh, send me an email. You can find me via the Fresh on the Net website. Click contact. You can send me an email. I'll happily tell you the place where you can get the cheapest domain names. After the name, the next most important thing is the story. I think the biggest common fault that we find at radio when listening to new music is that we'll hear a really good tune somewhere. So you go and click through to their website to find out a bit of context, a bit of frame around the picture so that you have some idea of what you're listening to. And so often, artists have no biog on their Facebook page. It goes about, and it might say, indie from the UK. Thanks. They don't tell you like they're a six-piece ska band from Northampton who formed in 2008. Even that basic information at least gives you a little bit of a story. But you really want a story that leads you into it, because music isn't just a commodity like a packet of cornflakes. Music is part of your identity. If I ask you what your favourite band is, and you say Coldplay, I'm going to form an opinion about you. <laughs> if you say it's Alt-J, I'll go, OK. If you go Dizzy Rascal, I'll go, well, you follow the pop charts, good. Every decision about music has to do with identity. So the biog, the little hook that you hang it on, really, really matters. And there's a really good one from that band I mentioned, The Tuts. I just looked at their Twitter and it says, the official Twitter of the out-of-control girl band, The Tuts. Not for the faint-hearted. You've got a picture of who The Tuts are and what they're about, just in that one sentence. I'll give you a couple of examples of the biogs, which I've got. One good and one bad. Heels catch fire are born from a shared vision of creativity and a burning ambition. The organic synthesis of vocalist Elliot's folk influence, the art rock persuasion of Laura's guitar playing, bassist Mike's power pop background and drummer Dave's ferocious rock style grew into a unique, taut, furious sound. Live, Heels Catch Fire are undoubtedly an exciting band. This foursome has the ability to hold an audience spellbound with their impassioned and unabashed juxtaposition of melodic intricacy and heavy rock intensity, crafted perfectly into a carefully weighted mixture of pop sensibility and art rock angularity that challenges the listener at every turn. Who's that written for? Is that for you or me when we go to the page? We can click play on their webpage and hear for ourselves how much we're challenged at every turn by what comes out the speakers. You don't need to describe the music to us. You do need to intrigue us enough to click play in the first place. And here's another one. Again, it's not strictly factual, but it's great. Athletes in Paris come from the northeast and sing in an accent too broad for anybody outside a 50-mile radius of Newcastle to fully comprehend more than little sound bites. To the accidental tourist, they are an indie band speaking in tongues. They have two drummers playing world beats and Latin grooves. 
and their idiosyncratic pop songs are punctuated with chanted gang vocals and frantic, muted guitar picking. It's one big multicultural northern melting pot. When I read that, that made me click play, and the music lived up to the hype. But it isn't full of adjectives saying great, or outstanding, or amazing. Let us be the judge of that. Don't tell us how great you are. Tell us how interesting you are. The story doesn't have to be true. It doesn't have to be factual. It has to be interesting. I would much rather hear a load of entertaining lies than a load of boring truths. So play fast and loose with the facts. Take a small aspect of yourself that's true and then amplify it to kind of cartoon-sized dimensions. So it's still true. You can still act up to it and you can still be that image when you're in public. But at the same time, it bears no relation to the private you that goes out and has a drink in the bar afterwards so that you're not personally laid on the line by what you do. The story of your music then feeds into the visuals, online, on stage, in your photographs, everything about you. The story, the visuals, the band name, the music, all need to kind of make sense together. Don't skimp on the visuals. Get the very best graphic artist you can to design the look, the colour scheme, the logo, the way your whole thing looks, and get the very best photographer you can possibly get to take your pictures. And if you don't like the way the first set of pictures turns out, get them retaken by somebody else. Don't just put a snapshot of yourself, shot with the iPhone, as your profile picture. There's a same way that anybody could pick up a guitar and play C, F and G. That's not the same as your music that you have studied and crafted and have specialised on and spent years developing. And it's the same with photography. Find a photography student. There's so many people out there at art colleges dying to have something great to work on, a project, something they can use in their end of year coursework. So why not befriend art students who'll take your pictures, who'll do your graphics, you can provide music for their videos that they're doing. So it doesn't have to be expensive, but as high quality as your music is, make sure your graphics, your visuals, your photograph is as good as that. Because it looks like you mean business. It looks like you're serious. You can believe in it more when you see it looking like that. So now, online presence. Can we just get a rough idea? How many people here are on Facebook? Most people. Everybody, I think, pretty much. Okay, how many people are on Twitter? Again, about 70 or 80%. Uh, SoundCloud, about 80%. YouTube, mm, quite a lot on YouTube. Tumblr, who's got a Tumblr? Few. Uh, who's got a Songkick account? Okay. Who's on Bandcamp? Quite a lot. And who's on Instagram? Some people with iPhones and smartphones there. Who's bought their own domain name? Good. Anybody got their music on Spotify yet? Very good. And has anybody set up their profile on Music Brains? OK, here's something you need to know about. BBC Radio, BBC Music Radio, when they play you, the computer generates a track list that attaches to that episode of the programme. So that anybody who's listened to the programme and goes to listen again, they can click on it and they can see all the music that was played in the programme. All the artists who are like on major record labels have a little picture of them by the name and they have a clickable link and you go to that and it goes to a page on BBC Music. That's bbc.co.uk slash music where they're trying to build a database of all the artists in the world. Anytime they play those artists, they direct people not off to the artist's own web page but to their BBC Music page. The BBC Music page quite often then has a link out to the artist's own page. But... When they play you, quite often there'll be just like a little blank cutout where there's no artist image and there's no clickable link to that artist. And that's where they've played a new record that has just come out or by an artist who hasn't yet arranged their Music Brains profile. Music Brains is spelt with a Z at the end, Music Brains. It's a public database of artists and it's open source and it's available to anybody. And the BBC uses Music Brains to populate its music pages. So if you have a Music Brains profile, you will then have a BBC music profile. So when people click through the track listings after you've been played on the Dermot O'Leary show, they will find biog about you 
all the releases you've put out to date, and most important of all, they'll be able to click through to your Facebook, to your SoundCloud, to your Twitter, and become your fans. How do you get onto Music Brains? I've put a guide on how to put your music on Music Brains, again, on Fresh on the Net. So if you just Google Fresh on the Net, go to my blog, and on the left-hand side you'll find how to use Music Brains. And then to get your photo appearing, you just write to the email address at the bottom of that article at the BBC. There's somebody whose job it is to manually upload the photos to go with the profiles. Facebook, Twitter, SoundCloud, YouTube, your own domain name, it's really worth doing. The Facebook is vital, even though it's horrible and it's intrusive. The key thing is, don't use your own personal Facebook, the one that you log in with. Create an artist page on Facebook and get it a short URL. You don't want to have facebook.com slash user slash 0825675 slash pages. Once you've got over 70 likes on that artist page, then you can get a short URL. And the way you do that is you go to facebook.com slash username, and there you can apply for the backslash you want. The other good thing about Facebook is that you can embed Bandcamp in there. And Bandcamp not only streams your audio, but it allows you to sell your music. So you can sell downloads to people, or you can allow people to have free downloads in exchange for their email address, or you can say, name your price. And sometimes people will give you 10 quid on Bandcamp if they think it's a really great track. If you just ask for 79p, that's all you get. So there's a lot of options there. You can put your tour dates on Bandcamp. You can even, if you haven't built a website yet, attach your .com to the Bandcamp page, and it leads straight there. But out of all these different profiles, particularly Twitter, SoundCloud, YouTube, and Facebook, make sure they're cross-linked to each other. Again, weeping frustration for us when we're trying to play your music on the radio. We find your Facebook, but then there's no links to anything else. We can't find your Twitter to let you know you're going to be on the radio tonight. That's stupid. Cross-link it. And on your Twitter, link back to your Facebook. Make sure you put a basic version of your story about being the out-of-control girl band, if that's what you are on the YouTube, on the Twitter. Keep the visuals consistent all the way across. If you play live, make sure you have an up-to-date list of all your upcoming gigs. If you just post it in your Facebook timeline, it goes down the timeline. Same thing with your discography and your upcoming releases. All too often you go to somebody's Facebook and it says, hey, check out our new EP, buy it today from here. Doesn't tell you what's on the EP. No track listing, no information about it. And you just click on it, and it goes to a page where you can buy the new EP. And it just says the title of the name, says the price, click here, fill in your credit card details. Most important of all, on all your web pages, have contact information so that we can find you and help you, so that fans can get in touch and become part of your family, so that people from the music industry who want to book you that moment for a slot that's just fallen free at a festival that weekend, can get in touch. They don't want to Facebook message you or send you a SoundCloud message or go to a contact form where they have to fill in the name and address and then type it into the box. Bollocks! Have an email address prominently on your Facebook, on your Twitter, on your YouTube, on your SoundCloud, so that people can contact you instantly. And I'd suggest have a mobile number as well. You may not want to give out your own private mobile number on a web page where anybody can find it. But you know what? Get one of those free SIM cards from O2 or whoever with a different number, put it in your phone, set it up to forward calls to your number. Job done. The easier it is to get in touch with you, the easier it is for people to help you. <sighs> Using Twitter. I think Twitter is misunderstood People don't use it properly, and people don't use it enough, and people don't understand how amazing Twitter is. It's not there to sell stuff. And that's a common mistake, is that when you go to somebody's timeline, it all says, buy our new single today, just released, or playing tonight at Camden Lock, blah, 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 blah. And it's all just promote, 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 promote. It's not there to sell it's there to invite people to join your gang. Twitter isn't a megaphone to shout at people. It's a telephone to chat to people with. Twitter is actually one-to-one. -one. 
between you and the people who see you pop up in their timeline. But it's also great for befriending future allies in the media, where you can actually get to quite influential people if you approach it softly, softly. If you don't just go, at Hugh Stevens, check us out! Why should he? But if you respond to a joke that Hugh has just made, or make a joke about something he's just posted, he'll have a little chuckle and maybe reply with a little smiley face or something. He'll notice you. A week later, something else happens on Twitter, you send him a link. Not to you, just conversationally. Just get onto his radar. I can't tell you how many people I've got to know on Twitter without them ever trying to sell me anything. Good way of approaching the future allies in the media is to ask them the reasonable question like, what is the best way to send music for your show? Every show has a preferred way of receiving music. Every blog has a preferred way of receiving music. Every journalist has a preferred way of receiving music. Some are old school. They like to get a CD in the post. They want something physical they can hold. They want to put it on their CD player. They want to take it with them. Others hate CDs. I hate CDs. Personally, I want digital every time. I don't want you to email me the MP3 itself and clutter up my mailbox. I don't know if I'm going to like it or not. I just want a link. Find my email address. Send me a SoundCloud link to one track. Don't ask me to listen to 20. Send me one track, one great track, an amazing track. It'll arrive in the email. I'll do one click to go to the page. I'll do one click to listen. And if I like it, I go one click, I'm going to play that. All it has to be is good. Moving on, YouTube. Again, very misunderstood. YouTube is not television. YouTube is a one-to-one -one personal medium. It's where you talk directly to one person looking on their laptop or looking on their mobile phone. Very conversational. So you can just record you talking into the um, webcam on your laptop. YouTube is a social network. It's an entire ecosystem, all of its own. There's a whole world of music on YouTube that has no relation to what happens in the music industry, in the charts, or on radio. YouTube is a world unto itself, and it's well worth taking part in that world. As you see a great video, click like, click favourite, post a comment, become part of the ecosystem. As you comment on other people's videos, they'll start to comment on yours. As you start to like and favourite other people, they'll start to go and check you out. And if you've got some good stuff up there or some great tunes, they'll click like, they'll click favourite. People will hear about it. The word of mouth will spread like it did with Gangnam Style. I mean, that's a one-off. Not every video is going to be like that. But you take the point. It's perfectly possible to be sitting in a bedroom with an acoustic guitar and a webcam and ratchet up two million plays. It does happen. Of course, there's hundreds of thousands of people sitting in bedrooms singing into their webcams, and it's rubbish. But they don't get all the likes. If your lyrics are amazing, if your performance is amazing, if the songwriting is amazing, people will give you credit and respect for that, and they'll pass it on. So, YouTube, don't underestimate it. Um, Joe put a headline about release formats and media promotion of releases. And I guess this is the nitty-gritty of what we're getting to. I think we need to distinguish between releases for promotional purposes and releases for retail purposes. Just to take retail, the real way that you can make money while you're still an emerging artist, and if you do live gigs, is through selling physical media at gigs. When you're negotiating with a promoter, to get the right to play at their scuzzy venue and they're going to pay you 40 quid while they sell beer for five quid a pint. The one thing to negotiate is the right to sell merchandise without them taking a bloody commission. Try to get the right to sell your stuff because then you do a blinding set and immediately you come off stage, you go to the CD table and there's a five minute window during which people are still hyped up after your last number and they just really go, oh, let's go over there and sell them stuff. You stand there signing things that people have bought, shaking hands, posing for photos with people. You shouldn't be seen handling money. Get a friend to take the money. Get one of those um, apps you can get on the iPhone which allows you to take credit card payments because quite often people have a credit card even if they haven't got any money. 
When they've seen you live and posed for a photo with you and they've got a signed CD by you, they've invested in who you are and what you're about. They're going to tell their friends. They're going to drag them down to your next gig. Anyway, that's physical selling CDs. I suggest early on that you don't invest in getting them pressed by a commercial pressing company. I suggest you just get card sleeves made up. You can get them made pretty cheaply and you can put a sticker on it with the tracks that are on it. And then you buy a 70 quid CD printer that will print on white, plain white discs. You get the really great artwork designed by your really great designer. So you colour print the CD so they look fantastic. And you make them one by one for the gig. So you just print off 10 for that particular gig and sell them, sign them and the, ca the card sleeve stays the same. So you've just got a thousand card sleeves under your bed, but you're printing off the CDs as you go. So that means as you improve the demos or do new songs, you can change the, the lineup of what's on your CD. You can get the better version, the remastered version. You can put them on there. And you haven't got to invest all the money in paying a grand to get some CDs printed or to get vinyl printed. That's a really important source of income because you get 10 people who've paid a tenner for an album of your demos. And they don't care that they're demos. People who bought Ed Sheeran demos in 2005 are now sitting on a fortune. So you sell them for a tenner, 10 people buy one, that's 100 quid in cash or in credit cards in your pocket at the end of the night on top of the 40 quid that the promoter paid you. If you do enough gigs and you sell enough CDs and have several CDs because some people want to buy everything you've got, maybe have some T-shirts, you will actually start to earn enough to turn your business over, to be able to invest further recordings, to get an income coming in from your music, which is a fantastic feeling. But the other reason to do releases is for promotional purposes. That's obvious. The fact is that promotion on blogs, in the press, and particularly on radio, all centres around release dates. Airplay is given in the weeks running up to a release date. And if they've been playing it before the release date and it's on the playlist, they'll carry on playing it for two weeks afterwards. But then after the release date's gone, it's over. They're on to the next record. The promo starts six to eight weeks ahead of the release date. Everyone knows that the release dates are fiction. They don't really exist. They're changeable by the pluggers from moment to moment according to which show's likely to play them. But they still endure as the key essence of how and when you get played. These days, pluggers tend to call them focus dates because that acknowledges that it's just bollocks, that the thing is actually available already on iTunes or the physical ones aren't going to come out till next January. But they call it a focus date. And what they do is they get a row of gigs around the time of the focus date. They put the YouTube video online a week ahead of the focus date. They get some press and blog activity happening in the week running up to the focus date, and they try to orchestrate the airplay leading up to the focus date. So that most of the year you're laying low, you're keeping a low profile, and then suddenly it's all started happening. People have started tweeting about it, it's started appearing on YouTube. There's an activity building up to that focus date. You go up there, you go for the high jump, you get as high as you can, you get what plays you can, and then you let it go. You don't keep on trying to get their attention. Lay low. You don't want to become a pest. Do it in bursts and tour around your release dates as well. So always have a release. Rather than doing individual gigs, if you can save them together and do them in a burst when you take two weeks off work and do a tour there and you release something, it focuses and it gives you much more lift. You can get much higher if you focus all the energy into that one period than if you're just doing a spot play here Magazine article there, blog there, gig there. As well as having your release date sorted, you need to pursue a dual track strategy when you're approaching the old media, that is, newspapers and radio. You need to have both a physical promo CD and a digital version on SoundCloud with all the release information and a biog and the contact information and your high-res, high-quality, beautifully taken photograph as the track artwork. But at the same time, you need a physical promo. You don't have to have it pressed up all beautiful and lovely. You just need to make it look like it came from a record company or from a plugger. Why? 
because you remember hundreds of CDs, 100 CDs a week coming into all these shows. Some of those CDs will be on an Asda CD scrawled in green felt tip and with a handwritten note stuck inside it and no other information. And some of them will come from record companies and pluggers. And when you only have time to listen to 20, people go through the stack of the 100 and they pick out the ones that look most hopeful. And the ones in green felt tip, the chances of that being a great record are about 1 in 70. Whereas if it looks like it comes from a record company, the chance of it being a great record is about 1 in 50. Not great, but still higher. And record companies do send some awful old shite. So, what does a promo CD look like? The main thing that a promo is, is a plastic wallet, clear plastic wallet, on which there's a sticker with all the relevant information that you need. The release date is on there, the name of the track, a short bit of biog about the band, and contact number and email address if you want to find out more about the band or book them as guests or anything else there. So that key information is there actually on the sleeve. It takes half an hour to unpack 100 CDs. So, you know, bits of paper are going to get lost. The insert is just laser printed, black and white. It's got a little logo on it, so invent a logo for your invented record company. Make it look professional and print it like that. And then the disc itself, again, isn't a finished one, but in this case it's a silver one, but it can be white. And your Canon printer will happily print on there. So it doesn't need to look fantastic for radio. In some ways, if it's just the name of the artist, the name of the track, a little logo and the time of it and where it's from, that makes it look professional because the professionals often don't have time to send out finished albums to people. The alternative is to, when you're doing the laser printing, do it with an inkjet and actually have a colour front to the insert so that it looks a bit more attractive to the eye when it comes out. But on the whole, don't send dual case CDs to radio. Here's why. The producer has gone through the 100 CDs and they're looking to take 20 of them home that night because they're so overworked, they need to check a few more of them for the show the next day. That's five dual case CDs. That's 25 plastic wallets. So which can they fit in their bag? We'll go for the 25. This stays on the shelf. Moreover, these are shrink wrapped. So that's an extra barrier between me and hearing the music. There is no sticker on the back of this shrink wrapped CD. Again, once I've got it open, I have no idea how to get in touch or when it's going to be released. Therefore, it's quite hard to take it to my producer and say, we ought to play this. So when's it coming out? No idea. What should you put out? I've said concentrate on one track at a time. I really believe that. Other people will tell you different, but I think focus on one track. So asking something really simple. Listen to this song. That's all you're asking. If you're sending them a whole album, listen to these 12 tracks. Forget it. Nobody's got time. The music fans haven't got time to listen to your whole album and find the one track that's suitable for radio. Let's put it that way. Single formats can either be the radio edit of the track plus remixes. That works quite nice. You can have a six-track single. So there's a radio edit, so you can immediately know there's something that doesn't have any language issues. And for goodness sake, don't send to radio a track with F-bombs all over it. We can't play it. And here's the other thing, the length of the track. There's nothing wrong with doing seven-minute dubstep instrumentals. They're great. But if you want to get radio play on it, the shorter the radio edit, the better the chance of getting airplay. I wish this wasn't true, but it is true. A two-minute something track has approximately double the chance of getting on the radio of a four-minute something track. Radio is broken down into half-hour clocks. That's to say there's a, an ident that comes on the hour, maybe news. At the half-hour, there's a news break. There's always half an hour at a time, slightly under, 27 minutes, because of the idents and the news and the jingles that you're forced to play. So in those 27 minutes, we can f play three nine-minute tracks or nine three-minute tracks. If we are going to play your seven-minute dubstep instrumental, 
that's another two or maybe three songs that we can't fit in. I have to stress, the two-minute track and the four-minute track must be equally good for that to be true. We're not going to play a shit two-minute song rather than a great four-minute song. No way. If you have an album that you're going to send to radio, I suggest you send it three times because persistence pays off. Don't just send it once and hope that it gets through. The first time, send a white label that you've burnt off yourself and printed of the key tracks. So it's just an album sampler, eight weeks ahead. Six weeks ahead, send them the full album as a white label. But put a sticker on it saying key tracks two, seven and nine. Four weeks ahead of release, send them the finished album with the lovely artwork that you've had commercially produced, if that's what you're doing. Because then that's the reminder. Like, oh, that looks nice. Oh, yeah, we had that. Again, sticker on it telling what the key tracks are. No shrink wrap. The only thing that actually counts is what comes out the speakers. Your music is either right for the show or it isn't right for the show. And that may not be a reflection on the quality of your music. It may be that you've sent it to the wrong show. It's either right or it isn't, and what comes out the speakers is the only thing that matters. What goes in a press pack? Uh, it was a staple of the 20th century music business, the uh, press pack. It would contain 10 by 8 glossy photos, preferably full colour, preferably two or three. It would uh, contain the artist's life story in excruciating detail. It would include loads of flowery PR guff about how great the artist is. And it would include lots of quotes about how great other people said the artist is. And it would then include a few little knickknacks like uh, badges, stickers, postcards. And then most crucially of all, it would contain the music and it would contain contact details. And that was used for sending to newspapers in the hope of getting reviews so that you'd get the journalists excited, or to managers or promoters to get them excited about signing up or using or giving the band a gig. Or it would be taken to conferences, music conferences like this, where you'd come up to everybody who looked like they had any kind of influence in the music industry and press one of these things on them, and you know, end up like loaded down with these bloody things. Anyway, the disadvantage of them was that they were expensive to make, they were bulky to handle and to store, they were troublesome to post to people, they're out of date almost as soon as they're printed, because you write new songs, new reviews come in, whatever. And at radio, at least, they get thrown straight in the bin. It's 2012. It's nearly 2013. You do not need a press pack, I think. You should put your music on a SoundCloud page. You can put the glossy photo, the high-res, beautiful photo, as the track artwork. People can see a small version of it, and they can click to download the artwork as big as you like, so they've got it if they want to put it on their blog. You can put all the biog information, the story that we were talking about, on there. You can put all the release information of when the focus date is, what label it's on, and what other bonus tracks there are. You can put the contact details on there, you can put the email address, the mobile phone number, and you can put a link to the YouTube all on a SoundCloud page, for free, and that's all you need. Write to the blogger, the journalist, an email with one link. And then what do you need at conferences? This. I was so impressed at a music conference where people were still trying to hand me press packs and physical CDs. One band came up and just handed me this. A little card, simple logo for their band, name of the band up big. It's got their .co.uk homepage, it's got their email address, it's got their Twitter, and it's got their Facebook. And then on the back, it's got a QR code. So you could just click and go straight through from your smartphone. How great is that? So use the 21st century facilities that you've got. Don't believe people when they try, tell you to try and do it the old way. You know what makes sense. You know what you like. Trust your own judgment. That's what I'm saying to you. Getting music to press and radio and blogs. Do it one-to-one. -one. Don't do mass mail-outs to lots and lots of recipients. Don't send a standard thing to everybody. Target individual radio shows. On the radio show, target both the presenter and the producer. Find out who the producer is and send to them personally, because they won't get many sent directly to them by name. 
if you want to get to them and avoid the CD pile, why not write them an ordinary letter, personally addressed to them, with no CD in the envelope? So people think, oh, this is personal, we better give it to them. On that, you can have the link to that SoundCloud page if you want to. But you've bypassed the system. You don't go into the CD pile. You get straight to the individual. Target them one-to-one. -one. Every individual writer on each blog, there's no point just writing to the quietus if you're writing to that blog. Find out whether it's going to be John Doran or Luke Turner. Which of the two is more sympathetic to your kind of music? You have to listen to the show in question to find out if they play your sort of music. Find out what that show's culture is, what makes them tick, what makes them laugh, what they're interested in. Same with the blogs. Read the blogs. Certainly for newspapers, because there are really important press, print journalists on Uncut, Mojo, The Guardian, The Telegraph, all across the board. Find the people who review the music that you make, that same bag, that same genre. Start to check out what they do. Google them online. Find the other articles they've written. Find out what makes them tick. Find them on Twitter. Follow them on Twitter. That's the big thing that most cheap PR agents get wrong, is that they don't send the right music to the right blogs or the right journalists or the right shows. You can do better than that. There's no point, as I say, sending grime to Radio 2. There's no point sending folk to Planet Rock. Build the relationship slowly, respond to their world, because if you seem interested in them, they're much, much more likely to be interested in you. When you've sent the music out, both digitally, through an email with a link, and physically, follow it up. The key to success is persistence. But the record must be amazing, otherwise the next time you press and try to get through to them, you're toast. So... Pros and cons of pluggers and PR companies. The pro of getting a good plugger is that they already know all the outlets that are likely to play your music. They know which shows have free plays and which ones don't, and they know the names of all the producers already. No research needed. So, the pluggers will already know all that stuff. They can make your promo discs for you. They know what to write on the stickers. They know how to make you sound interesting. They have privileged access to the radio offices. They can provide you with basic A&R skills. So they can say, they can listen to all your tracks and go, well, that's the one that should be the single. And they can go, that needs a radio edit. Or they can go, you know what? I don't think we can do anything with this one. And the very best ones will do that. They can give you strategy advice. They are your only realistic chance of getting onto a national playlist. Some of them will take on a really great act very cheaply because it makes them look good to be associated with talent. So if they're going around radio with an astonishing record, it makes them look really good. So some will do that, cut a deal with you, take you on cheap in order to build a long-term relationship so that when you're in the charts, they will be your plugger. And it also, most importantly, getting a professional plugger leaves you free to get on with making music. The cons of pluggers and PR companies, they're expensive. A top flight plugging company will cost between 2,000 and 5,000 quid for one campaign for a release for you, depending on how high up the ladder you go and how intense a campaign you ask for. There is no guarantee of results whatsoever they cannot guarantee even one play. They can only guarantee to make sure the producers hear it. But they might have got it wrong when they pick the single for you. And the commitment that they have, they will have lots of other acts they're plugging that week, some of which will be the £5,000 ones who they'll push a bit more for. So compared to you, if you're doing your own plugging, no comparison, you will be 100% committed to your release and you will do a much better job. And they're not all good. Some of them are bloody awful. There is another plugger who writes to every single act that's ever played on BBC Introducing. He goes through the playlists and sends an email to each one of them saying, I heard your track on BBC Introducing last night. It's absolutely amazing. I think you've got real potential. He has a standard email that he sends out because a few people have forwarded it back to me. I think your track was really amazing. has real potential. I'd be very interested in representing you uh, for PR, uh, you know, my rates are 
500 pounds deposit, blah, 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 blah. If you email me, I will give you my four favorite plugging companies. We're nearly at the end. Basically, set realistic expectations. Who here wants a number one record? Okay, keep your hands up. What is the current top five? Ollie Mers is number one, but then there's Bruno Mars, Rihanna, Labyrinth with Emily Sand, and Alicia Keys. Talk about realistic expectations. If you have your hand in the air for I want a number one record, listen to the number one records and the ones on their way there. Study it. All the serious people I know, like Egg White, professional songwriters whose business is writing number one signals, they listen to the charts like hawks. They're on it. Make your behavior match your expectations. Who started music as a way of getting rich? No. My guess is the reason you've started making music is because it's your life. It's because it's your passion. Music is a central part of who you are and what you do. You have to make music or you would burst. That's why you make, make music. So you want people to like and respect your music and you want people to like and respect you because of your music. Now, if you want mass success and recognition enough, you can have it. I promise you this is true. If you want it enough and don't care how long it takes, you can have it. But it comes at a price. The price is that you have to be totally single-minded, completely driven, and that you have to value success above security, stability, peace of mind, certainty, comfort, having money in your pocket, friendship, love, or family. Because those are the people you're competing against. You're competing against monsters who are so driven that that's the thing that they do. And that's why the big stars are all divorced, they're all drug addicts, they all have breakdowns, they're all in the priory. I mean, the pressures when living that kind of life are enormous. But my advice to you, based on experience, because I only ever wrote two amazing songs in my life. I released 15 albums as a recording artist back in the day, going back 30 years here. I only ever wrote two songs that busted straight into the charts that people heard once and went, fucking hell. And not everybody did. Some people hated them, but enough people liked them that they got into the top five. I can tell you that that kind of success isn't worth that kind of price. And I, from personal experience, would recommend to you that you focus on your art. Aim for a balanced life and making great music and great art, and let the other stuff take care of itself. Because if you focus on integrity, creativity, innovation, originality, and find your strengths and push your boundaries, that's the way to make the best possible music because you're a rounded human being and you have a balanced life. Follow your passion. That's my advice to you.